Hello and welcome to Goma Talks. This is the second in a series of three sessions exploring food, its production, consumption, symbolism, and its starring role in many forms of art. I'm Sarah Konoski from ABC RN, and RN is delighted to be partnering with Goma once again for the Goma Talk series. And tonight's discussion springs from Goma's current exhibition, Harvest, Art, Film and Food, which you here in the audience have hopefully had a chance to see firsthand. And it ranges from 17th century still lives to contemporary video, installation and photography. And if you're joining us out in the interweb ever, we also want you to be a part of this conversation. Goma Talks is being streamed live by um, webcast, and we want to hear from you. Questions and comments by using the hashtag at Goma Talks on Twitter, or you can send an SMS to 04888 Talks. And even if you're in the audience, we won't be um, stopping to take questions from you. If you want to participate in the conversation, and we'd love you to, then please do use Twitter at Goma Talks or SMS to 04888 Talks. But let me introduce the guests for this evening to you. We have Joanna Saville, who is Festival Director for Good Food Month and editor of the Sydney Morning Herald Good Food Guide. Paul West, who's host of River Cottage Australia, who swapped life as a high-end chef for the life of a farmer. It'll be interesting to hear about the cultural implications of that. And Diane Kirkby, who's reader in history at La Trobe University in Melbourne. And via Skype, we have from LA artists David Burns and Austin Young from the uh, collective fallen fruit, <laughs> sort of looming above us like a divine um, apparition. And their homage to the pineapple is part of Goma's Harvest exhibition. You might have seen that as you walked into um, the theatre tonight, as you, as you come in to Goma, it's there on, on the wall next to you. So please join me in giving them a round of applause to welcome them. <laughs> <laughs> so, from the earliest cave wall canvases, food has been a favoured subject of artists. Historically, artists have used food to evoke abundance, wealth and status. Think of those 17th century still lives with tables laden with exotic fruits and wines. But images of decaying food have also reminded viewers of our mortality and warned against the sins of indulgence, gluttony and vanity. With the enormous transformation of food production that's happened over the last 50 years or so, its globalisation and industrialisation, a new wave of artists are featuring food in their work. So what story are they trying to tell? David Burns and Austin Young, as Fallen Fruit, your art is all about food, fruit in particular. Why? Well, food is probably the most primary form of culture if we go back thousands and thousands of years. And in our case, we celebrate fruit, um, which is one of those categories. It shows up in art more than any other food in the history of the world. It's aesthetic, symbolic, and it ex it's accessible to all people on the planet. Yeah, something we all share in common. We, everyone knows the flavor of pineapple or a banana. <laughs> and so give us a sense of the kind of art activities that Fallen Fruit engage in. Uh, we make everything from videos, public participatory projects. Uh, we often work with cities and think of city streets more like a canvas or a studio instead of just working in the ideas of framing photography or, or um, works in a in that kind of exhibition constraints. We, we, also, um, we also think about bringing people together over fruit. We do public fruit jams, and <laughs> we, do this, we, we do a lemonade stand where we invite people to draw self-portraits on lemons, and we, we give them a glass of lemonade in exchange. What we ultimately do is collaborate. So we're really interested in collaboration, not just between us or with an institution, but with the public at large. So, Joanna Saville, I mean, this idea of collaboration, of bringing communities together, people together, this really is at the heart of food. Well, it, it goes without saying, really, that mostly the act of eating, ideally the act of eating, is, is a sharing and, and celebratory one, a very social one. Um, I've just come from the night noodle markets, which is underway here at South Bank this evening, and there are thousands and thousands of people there congregating around the act of, of food and it's something that you know has always brought people together over the millennia and it's also 
you know, part of that is it's very much who you are, what you create, how you eat. It's an expression of identity, something particularly for Australians, I think, that we've struggled with over the last 200 <laughs> years, but we're starting to really get a bit of a sense of ourselves as a nation through the food that we grow, that we cook and that we eat. And so, you know, this, it's very linked to community and identity, for sure. And Diane Kirkby, this idea of connection between food and identity, as a historian, are there big changes that happen across the last 200 years, say, in terms of our relationship to food? Well, I've, my work has actually been on the association between food and drinking and pubs <laughs> and Australian <laughs> identity. Like so, job, <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, that has changed. Um, that what sort of ways? Give me a sense of... Of, if, of the general brushstroke of those changes? Well, um, pubs used to be the place, they've always been an important place where people have um, eaten and they've provided very kind of basic nourishing sort of food at very low prices. And increasingly, of course, they've become much more uh, restaurant, uh, the gastro pub and so on. But for a long time, pubs were all about drinking and Australian drinking culture and so on. So, And that was very much focused around beer. And now, as we drink much more wine, for example, that the nature of the pub has changed in relation to that. Uh -huh. There probably wasn't much food in pubs once upon a time, was there? Well, it depended on the pub, I think. But by the licensing laws required them to provide food. So they always had to have, some, had, had a, a dining room and a bit of home cooking, which obviously didn't um, come up to scratch sometimes. And always <laughs> salt and vinegar chips, in my experience. And always salt and vinegar chips. Um, meat, meat pies and things like that. Yeah. And Paul West, I mean, one thing we'll come back to with fallen fruit is the, the political nature of this relationship between food and art and culture. Issues of sustainability, of mass production, these are highlighted in some of the artworks here in the Harvest exhibition, and they've been issues for you as a, as a chef and a farmer. Yeah, well... Uh you know, the world has a lot of negativity kind of in it at the moment. You know, I read a lot of books that kind of tell me that, you know, everything is going to end in a couple of decades and, uh, you know, it's a little bit intimidating sometimes. Uh, and for me, food is, is the, the natural starting point to self-empowerment, you know, when everything's kind of, you know, going to the dogs. Uh, food is a logical place to start where I can actually start to do something and affect some uh, positive change because you don't really need a lot to a lot of space or a lot of time or anything to do it. I mean, you can do it as simply as just uh, caring about where your food comes from, you know, and starting to ask those questions about how food's produced and, uh, and just informing yourself, you know, and learning more and more about food, which is happening in Australia to mm. a great, great degree at the moment. Mm. It's, a, it's a great time. We would love to hear your experiences of learning more about food or perhaps how you're experiencing eating at pubs and beyond. So please do use Twitter, hashtag GomaTalks or SMS to 04888 Talks. David Burns and Austin Young, let's head back to you over in LA land behind or in front of some magnificent wallpaper. We appreciate that. Um, tell, tell us about Pineapple Express, the work that features in Harvest. Uh, Pineapple Express is a piece that we, we made for this exhibition, and we really looked at the history of the pineapple. If you go back hundreds of years, even, even before Columbus discovered you know, the new world where pineapples come from, the pineapple was carried uh, across the su South American uh, continent as a symbol of hospitality and welcomeness. And Columbus brought that around the world and back again. It's always been part of the symbol of being welcome as a guest and also being receiving as a host. And that's part of about a place. Um, uh, we think about, so, you know, uh, we were thinking about Brisbane and, and uh, that the pineapple seemed like a, a, good, a good fruit to do, to do work about. And, <laughs> and we wanted to do, we wanted to connect people and get people to come together. Uh, and so, so, it w yeah, so, so we invited the public to, to participate in this exhibition by inviting them to send in work from their homes or personal artifacts to, uh, uh, ex to sort of explore how we've celebrated the pineapple through domesticity and through the idea of vacations and things like that. And you got an incredible range of artifacts. Oh, yeah, it's incredible. Um, uh, we, yeah, we got uh, a pineapple dress from Lisa Pizza Pineapple, a, a pineapple disco ball, 
um, ukulele, pineappleton. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing the broad range of, of stuff people are willing to share. It's kind of great. It struck me looking at the objects how many of them were homemade. It seems like the pineapple is a fruit that's inspired people to, you know, personal creativity. Yeah, well, it's also funny because it seems like it's really just very popular, especially this year in, in mass culture. You kind of see it. I don't know if you guys see it everywhere in Australia, but I'll tell you in the United States, pineapples are everywhere. It's kind of great. <laughs> yeah. It's pineapples true. are the new black. Is it... Um, <laughs> I have to ask if you've given, you know, that we're speaking to you from Queensland, from the home of the Big Pineapple. In your work in Fallen Fruit, have you worked with other fruit theme parks or is this a unique contribution <laughs> that Queensland has made to the world? <laughs> no, when, we, when, when, um, when uh, Ellie Buttress was, we were originally talking to, to her, she was the, the curator um, that we were working with, yeah, uh, we we started researching, and it was just the most exciting thing to find that there was a big pineapple. <laughs> it, 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 we, we found that there was there was a big banana too somewhere. It's true. <laughs> yeah, and there there was a big macadamia nut, but I think that might have collapsed. But there's okay. there's a whole lot of extra work that you could be doing here in Queensland. Diane Kirkby, yeah. from a historical point of view, the pineapple does seem an excellent choice. It's got a particular place in Australians' self-identity. Well, it's very interesting. I was listening to, to the talk and uh, I remember standing at uh, watching some pineapples being unloaded at LA Airport on one occasion. They were coming in in great boxes and I was thinking, why are they loading um, so many pineapples? And I realised they're grown in Hawaii rather than on the mainland. Um, am I right? Is that they're still not grown on the mainland of the United States? And I suddenly realised what we have in Australia is this wonderful abundance. Uh, we grow pretty well everything here on the mainland of Australia. Um, that uh, isn't true in other countries. So I think that's very particular and it's because one of the great richnesses of, our, mm. of, of Australia. And, mm. and I think there's something about the pineapple as, as an item of kitsch, you know? You just have to say pineapple and you guys are laughing. There's something about the pineapple that evokes some sort of uh, humour that's different. I mean, I guess the banana might be up there as well, but it's not... Um, some fruit are funny and the pineapple but also, is... Isn't it also true that, you know, Australian hamburgers have pineapple yes. on them? I mean, that's... Uh, and that, they're called Hawaiian. Particular. Hawaiian well. burgers. And, and I'd not, call them not a to mention burger. the ham and pineapple pizza. Not to uh, mention, yeah, yeah. you know, the authentic Neapolitan ham and pineapple <laughs> pizza. <laughs> so, Joanna Saville, I mean, talking about the place of food in art, uh, there's also a sense in there's also a sense that food making food can be art. I mean, it's described as the culinary arts. Is food making, is cooking more of an art or a science in your view? Oh, that's that's such a great question, and in the end, I don't know that there's probably a, an answer. It, it's it's like any artistic pursuit that is also a craft. At what point is the chef uh, a craftsman? And at what or woman, and at what point is the chef uh, an artist? Uh, certainly, in the the realms of the super personality chefs around the world, the ones who get listed on you know top restaurant lists of the world, there are many who would would see their food as an expression of themselves, of their story, their memory, their history, their emotion. Uh, Massimo Buttura is a, is an Italian chef who's currently ranked top in the world as as the from Italy um, and he his whole restaurant is full of artworks and he references many of the paintings contemporary art many of the paintings on the walls of his restaurant in the dishes that he cooks he also references his favorite jazz pieces and he he creates stories that actually tell the story of Italy you know 500 centuries of Italian migration of you know, the eel from the, the lakes of Comacchio to Modena, where he is, you know, it's all in one plate, and you eat it in about 30 seconds, which is <laughs> extraordinary. But, you know, there is very much this notion that uh, at some end of the, the chef's world, uh, chefs are creating dishes, unique dishes that are telling stories that no one else is, is telling. Mm -hmm. And I guess, Paul, you, you'd probably have a, an opinion on this as well, a chef. In terms of an artistic medium, there's not really many things that come close to indulging as many of the senses as food. I mean, you've got 
the taste, the, the, the sight of the food coming to the table, the smell, the texture of in your mouth that only leaves really sound out. And if you're at a table with good friends and you're having a good conversation, then that's uh, all the senses totally indulged. Uh, I mean, as a, as a, as a chef myself, it's a, it's a very exciting palate to have access to. And uh, as we can see now, that, you know, the, that top echelon of, <laughs> of, of chefs up there, uh, that even with what is essentially a very limited kind of, uh, you know, palette, you can still come up with infinite combinations that are, are, are reflective of the individual's both proficiency and artistic drive. So There's a somewhat cruel tweet here that chefs can definitely act like artists sometimes talk about divas. Yeah. So there's that <laughs> side uh, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, you know, sometimes, I don't know, I hope that's not referencing at me because if it is, I'm, I'm sure walking out of here <laughs> right now. <laughs> In fact, I mean, it's, it's to pick up on what Paul was just saying, just last month a study came out from the University of Oxford where psychologists were researching the impact that the way food looks has on the way that food tastes. And so these scientists, I hope with the help of a chef, created a, a salad, one with the same ingredients. One was just a tossed salad arranged as a, in, in a kind of a mess. One was neatly arranged ingredients. And one of the salads was arranged like Kandinsky's abstract painting num number 201. And all of the respondents said that this final salad, the one arranged like the painting, tasted better. And in fact, and Paul, you might want to um, note this, they were prepared to pay more yeah. for, the, for the salad that <laughs> yeah, looked that well, way. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> nice uh, so to if there's any prints available from the uh, Goldman gift shop, I might <laughs> take some inspiration. Uh, well, even as an apprentice, you know, and I didn't start at a particularly flash restaurant, but, you know, just kind of a, you know, a local bistro in Newcastle, even there, uh, my chef, when I was learning, was... You know, you've got to take so much care in the way that, thing go, that things go onto the plate because when you're eating things, the very first sense that is engaged, particularly in a restaurant, maybe not so much at home, is, is the sense of sight. You know, you, you, you see it go up onto the pass, you see the way to pick, or wait, just pick it up and carry it out and you're already indulging and your, your saliva is already starting to go and you're getting excited, hopefully, uh, otherwise you might be dreading your choice and, uh, and yeah. So that, 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 that yeah. visual aspect of it is, is very important and, and for fruit as well, I suppose that's why it's such an iconic uh, thing to work with for you guys because if you're walking through the bush or the, a forest or the jungle, you know, in a hunter-gatherer society, Fruit is the thing that visually sticks out, mm. uh, you know, like a, a bright coloured citrus or, you know, a big yellow banana hanging off a thing. So our eyes are uh, anciently trained to have that aesthetic appreciation mm. of, of food and mm. colour and the form. And I oh. think, can I just say, I was going to say that I thought that, that you, I agree with you that, that it's because food engages all the senses, yep. that, that that's what art does and that's why it is art. But also if you think about it, it's what we need to live. And so the um, appreciation of it, the enjoyment of it, is partly, is very much connected to the fact that Without it, you die. Without yeah, it, it's, you it's die. It's very much and a matter of life and death, and I yeah, think absolutely. that's what inspires art. You know, and that's why we need uh, all the senses to yeah. recognise it and appreciate it and enjoy Make it. Sure and so. yeah. <laughs> Make sure we eat. Make sure we eat. There, there yeah. has been a tweet about the relationship between food and class, and I, and I think that that ties into... I mean, one of the evolutions in the significance of aesthetics on food is the trend of Instagramming meals, which is mm. sort of a status thing of people saying, you know, I'm having this amazing meal at this amazing restaurant, have a look. So chefs have to pay a whole extra level of attention to visuals, given that that's the sort of um, message of their yeah. meals that's, that's being sent around the world for good or for bad. Joanna, is that the, the trend of Instagramming meals? I mean, how is that affecting the kind of food? Look, I think it's absolutely about the visuals and, and you rightly say it, it, it is quite of a status thing. It's, it's the latest in souvenirs is what you ate and, and you record it and people sometimes spend more time photographing their food than they do eating it. <laughs> but um, the other thing about it, I suppose, is that it, it's, it's the new theatre so that you, you might no longer go to a performance performance in a, in a theatre of, of a traditional play, but you might go to a restaurant like the Fat Duck, Heston Blumenthal's Fat Duck, where every single dish that arrives is, is a theatrical moment. It has a story, there are th interactive things that happen at the table, things get poured, vapours appear, things melt and change form. So it's something that you, you can actually capture of course, on your own personal device, mm. but you can, you can really experience that sensual mm. uh, 
element, all the essential elements of, of a dish that perhaps weren't so... When we were all hunting and, hunting and gathering, and it was a little bit more primal, people didn't probably think that much about the, um, the theatrical moment of eating. <laughs> they thought, there's a big bison. I'm going to move quickly. Yeah, no, yes. but, there, but there was an element of it, definitely. Maybe not theatrical, but definitely the spiritual element of eating, which a would have been a theatre and a lot of rituals involved. Ritual so in even culture. in ancient yeah, times, absolutely. you know, there mm. would have been, and some of the most ancient forms of art are these kind of giant mythical spiritual beasts that were no doubt hunted for food and we don't really have anymore but uh <laughs> so you know it's uh yeah. i mean when we're talking about sort of the, the high end level of eating and, and the 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 chef as artist you know the the one of the other interesting transformations that have, have happened over the last 20 or so years is this idea that um the demarcation between the kind of food that you might have in a restaurant and the food that you have at home is not as strict as it once was. We're meant to be sort of doing something at home that's similar to what's happening in restaurants, which just fills me with terror beyond, <laughs> beyond <laughs> I can say. But uh, connected with that change is the changing role of women in the kitchen. There's a really interesting video artwork in Harvest Exhibition from the 1970s, an American video artist called Martha Rosler, and she has this um, depiction of a woman in the kitchen which kind of looks like a prison. You know, it's a sense that was very strong in second wave feminism mm, of mm. the kitchen as a site of domestic drudgery, that women were going to shack off the second we had the chance. That's really been eclipsed, hasn't it, Diane, by this yes. idea that, the, that there's a very positive identity marker around cooking and performance in the kitchen. Well, also, I think there's much more, you know, men um, didn't cook at home uh, with that when you had that demarcation. So I think there's been a significant shift in that way. But I think um, the idea of, I mean, food and the association with women's work is very old, <laughs> traditional, and... Um, it was also it, it was also the case um, in pubs. You know, when women were working in pubs, they were either in the kitchen or um, often behind the bar. Um, publicans would get a license um, so that they, they, because they had to provide a dining room, then they had to have a kitchen, so that they would get the license. Uh, men would get the licence if they had a wife who could do those things for them. So there's always been this mm. association that women would, are associated with the production of food. <laughs> and, of course, the first industries that were actual... Um, uh, w pr food production was actually the first industry that was uh, industrialised. And people think of the Ford motor car as being the first assembly line, but it was the food industries, mm -hmm. and they were large employers of women. David, um, canning and so on. David Burns and Austin Young, I can see that you're <laughs> signalling wildly from LA. What, what is it that you're wanting to contribute? Well, I would just want to echo and agree with that. I think one of the things that people overlook is, is the mechanisation of food, and specifically fruit and canneries. It's something that revolutionised the way we experience food around the world, and the pineapple was really the gateway for that. Um, one of the things, besides the fact that it's a fruit that becomes modern, is that the employment, the people who did the work in the factories and the fields shifted to women mm -hmm. around the time of World War II. And it, it just was this huge culture shift that has a legacy that's, that's rather interesting. Mm. And that's part of the part of um, Pineapple Express is a series of it's quite a, a sort of trippy LSD looking video, but it is conversations that have been recorded with workers at the Golden Circle Cannery at um, at Nanda, which is where a lot of pineapple was processed in in Queensland, and it's workers talking about that assembly line experience. Absolutely, yeah. I, I just think. Um it, it, there's many aspects of food that we celebrate culturally and, and the way we relate to food keeps evolving. I think it's rather interesting. Yeah, yeah there was a, well, there were, we had one worker talking and then I channeled the pineapple. Sorry, um, you channeled the pineapple. <laughs> you I did. Yeah, I did. Could you do um, that again for us now, live? <laughs> Well, I, I, you know, I, it, was, it happened in Brisbane in, in my hotel room. I, I, I could try. <laughs> Sorry. It's not there, it's not coming through. But thank you for trying, Oster, that's sure. wonderful. Um, <laughs> and, 
on that, we just want to say if there's any comments that you want to make, if there's any channeling of fruit that you want to share with us, then please do use Twitter uh, with the hashtag GOMATalks or send an SMS to 04888 Talks. And there have been a few comments. What got you laughing over there, Paul West? Uh, <laughs> uh, do you think hipster beards will breed a new way of eating, perhaps how to strain soup through a stash? Uh, well, that's a, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I assume, again, it's referring to maybe this thing going on in my face because I noticed, <laughs> fortunately, that none of you lovely ladies have any beards. So, uh, uh, They're getting very popular, The former three right? guys, one of them has got yeah. a moustache as well, so maybe yeah. we could come up with something there. Uh, you know, so I don't necessarily think it's a hipster thing, but... Uh, but yeah, you know, minestrone, we could just get the pure tomato coming through there. Um, I don't know, it's a good Sustainability, question, to, sustainability uh, on a whole new level. So I'm going to be mulling over tonight, for sure. The Twitter is called Bogan Boobs, Bogan which Boobs. is also quite interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Um, if, if, we're, um, if, if we're talking about... Um, uh, where are we? There was another tweet that I thought connected to that. Well, there's one comment here about kids having taste buds on the inside of their cheeks mm. until age five, which is a fascinating piece of information. If it's true, we will trust. It's also Bogan Boobs. We're trusting Bogan oh, Boobs. Boobs coming um, through with the goods. <laughs> <laughs> how, um, how much of this, of this, and I'd be interested to hear from, um, from, from Austin and David and Joanna, maybe perhaps from your outreach work, is involving children differently in food. I mean, how much is... Is this changing the way that food and education happens? In Australia, there's all of Maggie Beer's kitchen gardens. Is this, is this part of the push that's happening to shift the way we're thinking about not just the mechanised end point of food, but having a new or re, re-engagement with the Look, production? I think so. I, I think there's, you know, the, the rock star chef, the diva chef, um, the, also has a, the opportunity to be a responsible uh, responsible social activist to a certain extent and someone like Stephanie Alexander and, and Paul with the show that he does uh, can actually perhaps talk about food in a way that does change people's perceptions and, and, and attempt to, to educate people and to chats. I think more, most importantly you know the notion that everyone should be able to feed him or herself and that doesn't just mean being able to put things in your mouth, but being able to procure food, having having access to good food, but knowing how to cook it as well. And so I think what you are also seeing with some of the some of the chefs who are now big personalities is that they're able to influence change and become social activists, if you like. And I think that's a fantastic thing. And, and certainly Stephanie Alexander has been doing that and is doing that with children. Maggie Beer is now doing it um, with aged care mm. and trying to change the quality of food that older people are eating. And, and Paul, with what he does with his show, and, and Hugh Fernley Whittingstall before him, very much talking about where our food comes from and, and the realities of that. How much of that is, is it a driver for you, Paul, oh, with, well, with your work? Uh, it's probably, for me, one of the most important things that's most important conversations that's happening in the world at the moment because uh, food production is incredibly far-reaching in its impact, you know, not just socially but environmentally and economically. Uh, and kind of going back to, to talking about kids and using that social activism, in, in my experience, because I've, you know, I've been doing this for like two years kind of thing, it's not, not exactly an old hand at the old TV gig, but the people that get it are the kids. I've, like one of the first things that really kind of shocked me about you know, being on screen was, it was actually in Brisbane last time I was up here last year, this little kid, this little four-year-old, like drags his mum over and stands there like this, and then his mum's gone, go on, tell him, tell him, go on. And uh, this four-year-old kid, like no word of a lie, was, I used to not eat meat, but then I saw how you killed a chicken on TV, and now I'll only eat chicken if it's killed like that. So it's like a, <laughs> a four-year-old ethical vegetarian. I mean, I was worried about <laughs> finger painting when I was four. But these, so it's incredible. They, they just, they, when it comes to food, I think that kids just instinctively get it because, you know, it's that survival mechanism. Like, they would have been, you know pre industrialization out there foraging around in the bush looking for things to eat. And so when you take them out into a garden and you, they see a fresh sugar, sugar pea or something like that, they, they can't get enough. You literally got to go save, save some for, for dinner, kid, but nah, go for now, it. That is it's great to see you doing it. That's definitely going to get the vegetarians tweeting. Um, yeah, that, that, yeah. That, that, that comment, so we'll, we'll in a expect way, some of those comments right? in, a, in a good way. Good on you, kid. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think, though, that what's, um, there's, a, there's a comment here about 
pushing learning about cooking as adults in modern media? Why is home economics and learning cooking through school falling by the wayside? And I think that's, that is a really interesting one. Diane was mentioning um, this sort of new melding between what happens at restaurants and what happens at homes. And, uh, and, I, and I think that there's something about, um, Joanna, about, about this, this change in this... Um, um, I've now completely lost my um, yeah, train well, of thought. You, were talk, yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> you can jump in now um, and I'll just have another sip of champagne. Yeah, and, and, um, and people, one of the people do, do say that this, this comes up all the time, that you know, we're trying to educate children about cooking and, and where their food comes from and eating it, but yet, and yet you know, learning good old home ec doesn't seem to be happening very much in high schools anymore. And then mm. on the other hand, of course, you've got food as, a, as an extreme sport on television now where you know, everybody's competing, racing to cook boxes of mystery ingredients in, in all sorts of mm. ways, which I think actually probably is quite intimidating for most people, yeah. you know, that you, you no longer feel you can just bung on some spag bol at home, you know, you've got to plate it up for a start. Yeah. And, uh, and talk about it for 15 minutes and why you chose that sauce to go with that bolognese. So, you know, in a way we are, I, I think it is a little concerning because, and you can, you can get, you know, I have 20 year old daughters, you can, they can get takeaway like that. Fortunately, they know that it's cheaper to soak a bag of beans and make a you know bean ragu the next day and that will last them for a week or, or you know buy a curry paste and, and a few veggies and make something at home but most people don't learn that anymore and I yeah. do think it is a concern it comes back to the, what I was talking about before about people being able to feed themselves yeah. in a really really basic way and I do think those skills Mm. are going by the board and yet yeah. we're all food obsessed. Yeah. So yeah. how does There's that There's a huge well, disjunct, isn't there? It seems that school now isn't so much about, you know, learning life skills. It's about uh, academic high-flying, you know. You've got to get into uni. You've got to get the high marks. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to get the high marks. <laughs> so, you know, it's not, it's not about that life skill. It's about maximising your earning potential yeah. when you're out of school, not about trying to figure out how to live your life to its fullest potential. So who taught you how to cook? Uh, well... I was a terrible, terrible cook when I left home because uh, my mum was a legend. She was uh, in the old school cooking food every night type thing. We never ate out. She cooked every night with a repertoire of about five dishes, but that was fine. Uh, Dad cooked twice in my entire upbringing. And what uh, was those uh, occasions? Sausage curry both times. Uh, first one edible, second one totally inedible. Uh, and then I started teaching myself and then I kind of discovered gardening and then I got interested in where food was coming from and uh, did a lot of work in community gardens and on farms and then after that I went, well, I can start to grow it now but I still can't cook to save my life. So I started a chef's apprenticeship at age 23 and uh, uh, the, the most significant teacher would have been a very angry French man down in Melbourne, I'd say. So definitely learnt by the, uh, the flying fry pan was the... <laughs> <laughs> the old the fear school. technique. Definitely, yeah. the, the physical intimidation and yeah. fear was pretty pretty big on his agenda. But of I think there. Paul's drawn attention here to something that I think has been a significant change, and that is the extent to which you talked about your daughter's eating takeaway, but the um, blurring of the lines between cooking at home and eating out is so much more common now. My, you know, my yep. kids, they take it for granted that half the time they're eating out, and it's much more of mm. that... Um, whether it's at takeouts or at restaurants, or and they get or food. They, they yeah. don't and go they and then food, buy yes. dinner. They go and get food, yeah. which is I hate that expression. You know, I'm <laughs> just going to get food, Mum. Um, plus, they go out for breakfast now. I mean, really, who can't? If you can't cook your own breakfast, that's the most accessible <laughs> meal in the day. Joanna, for the this, home you, you are not meant to be pushing this line. You were here as sort of the, the good food. <laughs> month. We're all meant to be at the night noodle markets. I mean, this is you, you should stop now and think about what you're saying, Paul. Just just, I, I wonder, Joanna mentioned the sort of phenomenon of, um, of competitive cooking. ...towards your, uh, your fellow uh, staff. I, I think it's driven by the human drama. I think food's that kind of the common touchstone that we can all relate to. And, uh, and having it as this competitive... Yeah, exactly. And having it as this competitive sport now is that, you know, that you can sit at home on the armchair and you can see people having a crack and, it, and it's uh, relatable because it's not, you know, some... You know, it's not Heston Blumenthal doing it. It's just old mate bricklayer from, from you know, But they're doing Parramatta. Heston Blumenthal-type dishes. Yeah, yeah, dishes. trying, trying, yeah. which they're is intriguing They're not doing sausage curry. We, well, you know, 
If uh, anyone, a producer from MasterChef is out there, John West, my father, is available to do a <laughs> master class on the sausage curry. I'm sure he hasn't forgotten it. Uh, third time's the charm. <laughs> and if you're joining us, MasterChef producer or not, whether you're online or on your radio, this is Goma Talks, discussion on art, film and food, live from Brisbane's Gallery of Modern Art. I'm Sarah Konoski from ABC RN, and my guests tonight are River Cottage Australia host Paul West, Good Food Month Festival director Joanna Saville and historian Diane Kirkby and via Skype fallen fruit artist David Burns and Austin Young. <laughs> and we'd love to hear from you. Tweet us with the hashtag at Goma Talks or an SMS to 04888 Talks. Austin and David, are you again agitating to be included in this conversation <laughs> or are you smiling just out of good feeling in the fact that it's quarter to two in the morning in LA? <laughs> <laughs> yes? Can we have some sound from these guys? Yes? Yeah? Oh, Was yeah. Some hey, Sarah. Hey, we're, we're, we're enjoying the conversation. Yeah, it's, it, and it's... Uh, well, what do you guys think? I mean, given that your work's about trying to um, connect communities around food through things like lemonade stands and community jam making, what do you think about the rise of the sort of celebrity chef and, and you know, competitive cooking on television? How does that fit with your understanding of food? Well, well... Um, we, we, when in our project we were really looking at fruit in public space, and, and it, in urban neighborhoods. So, so um, we we like to think of it as the new fast food. Because <laughs> I think as I think as you as you've said, part of your projects are about encouraging people to eat the fruit that they come across on fruit trees in their local neighborhood. A lot of us have um, concerns about that, this idea that it's kind of not hygienic or perhaps it's illegal <laughs> to just take an a, you know, a, a orange from a tree, as I might in downtown LA. Well, you, you probably want to make sure it's not illegal, but in most places in the world, it's not a problem. Um, but the fear of food safety is, uh, is a big issue. And ironically, it's actually not a problem. It's the opposite. Um, deciduous fruit <laughs> trees are completely... Um, fine to eat. It's no problem. Anything that might be toxic does not go into the fruit. That's part of the plant's reproductive process. So it, it never is harmful in any way. I mean, well, the fruit trees, they, they'll shed the toxins through the leaves. But um, uh, uh, you, you probably want to wash it off. <laughs> <laughs> We don't want anyone coming down with some terrible gastro after taking <laughs> no. advice from the Fallen Fruit Collective. Um, no, so we, so okay. yeah. talking about the, the relationship between visual art and food, there's also, of course, a very strong relationship with the performing arts, which I think, you know, we've kind of hinted at. This idea that, um, that, that food preparation is a performance art because a lot of kitchens, Joanna, have been opened in, in restaurants. And what's your... Uh, sense of why that's a trend? Look, I think it, it's part of that performance element that I was talking about before and, and the restaurant as, as theatre. So not only do you go in and, and see a dish arrive on your plate that sometimes has something poured on it or that you actually interact with, but do you also get to see the preparation of your food and, and all of the rituals and moments that go around that. And in a lot of restaurants now, the pole position is the, is sitting up at the counter where you've got the chefs over the other side so you can see every single element. And it is, it's really intriguing and entrancing most of the time because they're on show, they have to behave themselves so there's no, no sort of <laughs> grotty, <suspense>. grotty <laughs> cloths and things going on and certainly no F words. But um, it's, it's, it's part of the anticipation, I suppose, as well of waiting to see what is coming to your plate and that you, you know, it's, it's building up that momentum yeah. as well. It's, it's great fun and I, I think the open kitchen certainly enhances the experience. Uh, there are some open kitchens that aren't so gorgeous, in which case they should be closed, but, <laughs> you know, a, a beautiful open kitchen where everything moves mm. almost balletically yeah. is a wonderful adjunct to the whole dining experience. Yeah. Can I just say that I think restaurants have always been theatre, but the shift has been from the customer, who's actually always been performing and acting out rituals True. of class and, and gender and status in various ways. Um, it's shifted now to the production of the food in the kitchen, but mm. it's always been an element of theatre. And f 
you know, uh, rituals and, and cultures around food, where it's eaten and how it's eaten and who's eating it and so on, have always been tied to society and the social context mm. and issues about class and status. I notice quite a few of the tweets that are coming through are about these issues of class, class and mm. poverty and this focus on, you know, um, food in when so much of the, the world is still mm. in poverty. And I think... When I'm teaching my students, I always say to them, you know, food is, it's always about politics. Your point about having control, being able to change things by being in control of your food. The most powerless people in the world are those who have, do not have control over their food. And you yeah. can see this even from the time, you know, uh, human beings are born, babies do not have the ability to feed themselves. They are the most powerless individuals in our society. And that's true on a, on a global scale, if you don't have control over your food supply and mm. access to your food. So I think we should always keep that in mind, that there's always a power relationship, there's always a politics, there's always um, a class yeah. and, and gender relationships and that are being performed in relation to food and food sharing. I want us to get to food and activism and how art connects all of those before we end. But just before we move to that, Paul, I'm interested to hear your opinion about the chef as a performer. I mean, you take yeah. that to one level as you're on television, but even without the camera crews there, yeah. are you a performer when you're cooking? Uh, well, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, you know, the talking about the kitchen as theatre and the opening of kitchens is, you know, it's, it's, we've spoken about it from the perspective of the diner of the person going in and watching the wizardry and the magic mm. happen. But from uh, the perspective of the person in the kitchen that's doing the work, now all of a sudden it's opened up a relationship because, you know, so many kitchens are underground, tucked away and out the back, and you might spend 16 hours a day sweating in there, cooking 200 meals, and never look a person that you cook for in the eye. And so, you, you, and you have so because of that disconnect, there's mm. also a, a level of apathy and, and resentment that can come through working in a closed kitchen because it's just a little a piece of paper with some words on it. It's not actually someone that's sitting there and enjoying a meal. And I know, I think a lot of chefs forget that, that you might have been there all day, but this person has come in and that might be their anniversary and they might have been planning to go out for this dinner for six months and just because you're in a bad mood, you can't, you know, uh, project it onto mm. them and their meal. So having that open kitchen really does break down the barriers between the diner and the, and the producer in the kitchen. And, uh, you know, it's fun. It's, uh, it, there is an element of performance to it because, you know, you're moving, you're dancing, you're seasoning things, you're tasting things. You know, some people perform a little bit better than others. Some are, <laughs> you know, there's all there's the very kind of, you know, yeah, heavy, heavy handed uh, military types. And then there's the, you know, the, the slightly more impassioned, twirly, high salting, <laughs> pan shaking <laughs> variety. For those of us joining us on radio, Paul's now doing some wonderful calisthenics involved in, in cooking. And there, it seems that some cuisines are differently suited to this. There's that wonderful film, Jiro Dreams of Sushi, about the Tokyo sushi chef, Jiro Ono, and he stands right in front of the people who, are, who have come to his sushi restaurant and he hands the food to them, to them, watches them eat it, um, put it in their, in their mouth with their hands. There's that eye-to-eye -eye contact. It's yeah. a very close relationship yeah. between, between and he, chef and eater. And he also designs the, the size of the, the sushi piece for the person that it's oh, intended cool. for. So if it's for a woman, it'll be a certain size. And he, he actually gauges his customers and then, then you know, moulds his sushi accordingly. And that's the other extension in, in a lot of the, you know, new end, new top end, pointy end restaurants around the world too, is that the chefs not only are in an open kitchen, but they actually come out of the kitchen yeah. and bring the dish to, to, at Noma, for example, in Copenhagen, yeah. which is currently number one in the world. It's one of the things that they probably pioneered in a lot of ways, is the chefs all coming out of the kitchen to bring, to serve the diners yeah. with the dish that they've created. And that's very important for, for my mind, for, for, for coming from, uh, you know, the, the professional background of being a chef is that you really, you do need that relationship because you need, you, you, you're cooking someone for someone, you know, and that's one of the best gifts that you can give someone is that gift of nourishment and, and satisfaction mm -hmm. and, and a, mm -hmm. a hearty meal, you know. So it's uh, to, to put all that energy and love into creating a dish and then not actually be able to see it delivered and enjoyed. It's just kind of like wrapping up presents that you've crafted yourself and, uh, you know, and just putting them in the post mm -hmm. and never even seeing where they go. Not there. 
So <laughs> let's, we've only got 10 minutes or so left, so let's sort of bring some of these different themes together with this idea of activism connecting food production, consumption and art. And I'd love to go back to David Burns and Austin Young from Fallen Fruit joining us in LA. The byline or one of the bylines on your website is share your fruit change the world. <laughs> I mean, if you want to take activism in, in, in one of its most primary forms, and it is a social thing, and the act of sharing could be really radical in the world. I mean, if we all shared, we would never go without. It's just a fact. Yeah, so we think about, we think about the idea that if we all planted fruit trees on the, on the edge of our properties so that uh, our sidewalks could could just become like community gardens. It would just change the way cities are experienced. That's one of the things that we really get behind and get excited about. So change them nutritionally but socially equally. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. There's no doubt. Those things should go together. And, and I think, I mean, something that's, that strikes me in the way you're talking about your artistic practice and its goals is a real joyfulness. This is not kind of hit you over the head activism. This is, this is happiness. <laughs> no, in fact, the, the origins of, of Fallen Fruit as a project was, is it possible to take the agency of activism and not have opposition? Is it possible to do something that has that kind of energy behind it where it's just completely inclusive? The answer is yes, everyone can do this. Well, well yeah, like, like we think you, most forms of activism have polarization. So we, we, we were able to create a project where, you know, I can't, if you, if you don't like a, ban a banana, but I do, we're not really going to fight about it. <laughs> <laughs> and who gets the rough end of the pineapple? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I had to do it sooner. <laughs> because, um, I mean, there's the issues about uh, food production, its globalisation, the industrialisation, the mechanisation, these things we've talked about, they come up in a lot of the contemporary works in Harvest Exhibition. There's a fantastic video work um, by a collective from the Netherlands called Aeronaut Mick, uh, pulverous, which has got this, this sort of just slow pan of a supermarket, an Asian grocery store with a whole lot of people just destroying it, just yes. taking mm -hmm. items off the shelves, pulverising, um, you know, noodles, wrecking the walls. It's, it's a really compelling work. I've gone through the exhibition a number of times and people are stopped and, and fascinated by it. I mean, there's this, this, this underside of what we've been talking about more as a sort of positive celebratory aspects of food culture and food sharing but as the other goma talks in this series focus on there is the 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 um, consequences for environment and health that are in the way that food happens now so paul how much of how much can you as one chef affect change do you think if we're thinking about issues of activism well um, i mean i can only start really with what i do myself and uh i'm fortunately in a position where where what i do myself is broadcast on a television show so i mean in a position where i am i mean uh, i really hope that i can have some sort of positive influence and and in the experience that I've had over the last uh, two series, that, that the, probably the most profound impact has been on kids. And uh, again, going back to what I was talking about before, about how they kind of instinctively get it, uh, you know, the, 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 the show has pictures of farms in, in, a, in a field, of pigs in mud, of chickens in a coop, you know, uh, and that's what, where food should be in a way, you know, that's uh, not the industrialised system where, where you'd look at it and it would probably give a kid nightmares if they saw where their bacon or their chicken or their eggs were really coming from or their vegetables, you know. They, 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 they see that and they relate to that kind of, you know, idyllic farming landscape. So, and I think you've got to get in there early. Like, mm. that's, uh, I mean, adults are very powerful. Uh, obviously, we've got the most personal power, but to be able to impact on the way that children kind of think about things and see things from a young age, I mean, that's... Mm -hmm. that has a great potential for the future because realistically the people that are growing up uh, you know now in primary school age now food is going to be incredibly important to them and uh, and it's going to be an even bigger global issue I mean we're just at the kind of the cusp of this of this enormous shift in you know in, in food availability on, on the planet and and that tipping point between total industrialization and a resurgence in small-scale farming mm. 
And Joanna, connected also with that, as, uh, as, as a lot of your work has done with SBS and with the Good Food Guide, is how food is such an expression of cultural identity and in somewhere like Australia that there's been this embrace of a multicultural identity through food. But do you think we're in danger of that becoming homogenised out in terms of uh, globalisation of food? Are we, are we losing distinct food cultures? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think we always like to talk about the way that our food identity has been shaped by all of the different uh, food cultures that are part of what is everyday eating and drinking for us. I mean, all of us will, you know, use a wok one night and cook pasta the next. So that's very much who we are as Australians. But, you know, the history of, of food around the world before this incredible globalised age that we all live in was that you know, food changed by through trade, through colonisation, through availability, through climates, through all sorts of things. I mean, before Columbus, there were no tomatoes in Italy, you know, those sorts of stories. So, you know, I, th I think we shouldn't be too negative about change and, and fusion of cuisines and new things coming out because they always have. The polarisation that we're talking about, where you've got bad, cheap food on one hand that is more accessible to people and usually slightly more expensive, better produced food that is less accessible to everybody and finding that middle ground where perhaps people can understand that for environmental and health reasons and actually ultimately for their own personal well-being it is better to have good food that they cook themselves well if we get there it'll be wonderful mm. but i don't know if we will mm. and uh, on on that distinctive food culture uh, point we t we don't eat public insects <laughs> Depends how high in protein they are, I suppose. <laughs> uh, on that distinctive food culture, if, if, we, if we start to move away from the industrial model and we start to eat more in tune with the seasons and we start to reduce our, you know, our, the distance our food travels to our local area, we've got that access to the global technique because you know, it's, we're living in such a golden age of, of, of food in, in culinary production. I mean, terra madre and things like, you know, it's so free. The, 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 the knowledge is sharing now. It's not, oh, that's my secretly guarded recipe. They're like, this is how I do this and this is how I do that. But still within that regionality of the actual food production, there is a unique element of ingredients and there's unique flavours that are reflected by the mineral balance of the soil and the, you know, terroir, you know. Well, Paul, and you were mentioning um, before we, we came on the panel that um, there used to be a tradition of eating Australian native birds, yeah. rosellas and other birds like that, and the flavour of those yeah. would vary depending on what the bird had been eating. Uh, so I can't talk uh, to this uh, personally because uh, now it is illegal to, to, to eat Australian <laughs> birds, uh, unless it's a farmed emu, but... Uh, uh, but some of the old bush characters down where I live in central Tilba, uh, in fact, were telling me just last night that uh, depending on what time of year there is, like, like bees and honey type thing, that uh, whatever nectar and whatever trees are flowering, that the meat of that bird will uh, actually taste that. So, I mean, there is an element of literalness, I don't know if that's a word, in you are what you eat. You know, so, so they, we, we feed corn to chickens and acorns to, to, to pigs in Spain to give them a very particular, unique flavour. So if we're eating our, what is grown in our region, then, you know, we really are the kind of salt of that earth. Mm -hmm. Connecting to our soil. Yeah. Yeah. And then you feed cows on corn and bits of other cow and you... <laughs> wonder where the disconnect is happening, <laughs> it's scary. I think fallen fruit need to get to near where you live, Paul, and do a sort of yeah, series of artworks come, around the rosellas. Unfortunately, there's no pineapples, guys, I'm sorry, but there's plenty of other great fruit going on down there. <laughs> that is where we will have to leave this oh. Goma Talks discussion here at the Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane. Oh. In two weeks, the final in the series of Goma Talks, coinciding with the exhibition, Harvest Art, Film and Food, is going to be hosted by my colleague from RN, Paul Barclay, and he's going to be examining the policy politics surrounding contemporary food culture, looking at debates over food labelling, junk food, dieting. So some of the tweets that came up, and, and I'm sure some of the issues that have been raised for you by this conversation will be explored in more detail uh, in a fortnight's time here at GOMA or then later on your radios at Radio National. 
Please thank our guests. We had uh, Joanna Saville, Festi Festival Director for Good Food Month and editor of the Sydney Morning Herald Good Food Guide. And don't listen to Joanna. Go to the food, um, go to Good go Food Month, food. eat out. <laughs> no, no, eat food out. Sharing and celebration was the other element. Though, yeah. and, and Paul West, chef and host of River Cottage Australia and farmer. And Diane Kirkby, reader in history at La Trobe University in Melbourne. And joining us from Skype at the very impressive time of 1.30 in the morning were artists David Burns and Austin Young from Fallen Fruit, whose work Pineapple Express is just outside as you leave this evening. And I'm Sarah Konoski from ABC RN. Many thanks. Good night. Thank you.